go ahead. So you're all very welcome th this morning to the conference. And to begin with, we'll have uh, uh, an introductory welcome from uh, Professor Kieran O'Hogarty of the uh, University of Galway. Welcome to the University of Ireland History Conference. Uh, my name is Kieran O'Hogarty. I'm president of the University of Galway and president of the University of Ireland uh, Council. And I think it's particularly important that we uh, gather together to, first of all, reflect on, on history themes, on, on the important history themes that, that bring us together uh, and the challenges uh, on this island. Uh, and then secondly, that we reflect on uh, history itself and its purpose, its importance for the university, our understanding of ourselves as human beings, as, as communities of, of uh, scholars, but not only a community of scholars, but communities of, of people who work together, who live together, uh, who are sometimes challenged by each other. Uh, and it's really important that level of understanding and respect that, is, that comes through in the papers here, that comes through in the research that's done, the evidence that, that, that is uh, brought together here, and that we understand each other to a greater extent uh, because of the work that's done here, that we understand our, our, our shared history uh, and the, uh, the future that is together here for us on this island, uh, that we uh, use history and the methods that you've used in a way that's respectful, respective of all traditions, uh, but at the same time uh, reflects on the, our differences and our shared uh, experiences uh, in a way that we can learn from together as a community. So I wish the conference all the best. I wish all those taking part all the best. Congratulations to you all. I'm sorry I can't be there, but I look forward to hearing uh, of all the good work done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Gormagas Ashin Olive. And uh, you're welcome to our first uh, panel which curiously is called Crisis Panel. I hope the crisis refers to, the, uh, to history rather than the panel itself. So uh, we'll have three speakers, and um, we'll have a short then question and answer session uh, afterwards. So our opening speaker is Dr. Shifra Aitken, who uh, lectures here in Queen's University and has done some very uh, imaginative and uh, insightful work uh, on the Civil War and on Civil War memories. So we're very much looking forward to our paper, uh, Silence Within a Silence, Civil War Testimonies and the North. So, Shifra. Um, thanks so much, Emmett, for the generous introduction. And thanks to all the committee and for the invitation to be here as well. Um, I was delighted actually to speak at a Universities Ireland conference, I think in 2020, at the height of the pandemic. I remember um, uh, doing that conference paper from um, uh, in Galway at the time. Um, so it's fantastic to be here in person and to meet um, the, the, the committee. Um, and also, I suppose it's interesting in terms of the, the cross-border relations of the organisation as well, that I was working in Galway before, and now I'm in Queen's. Um, so hopefully that's something that we can uh, continue to build on in terms of the, the, the North and South uh, partnerships. Um, so my paper today is entitled A Silence Within a Silence, Civil War Testimonies and the North. Um, and what I'll be doing really is, is reflecting on um, some of the work I suppose I did in my book, um, it's Spiritual Wounds, Trauma Testimony in the Irish Civil War, and that came out earlier this year. But I think as soon as you, a book comes out, in a way, it's already out of date. Um, and one of the things I, I did feel that when I, when I was working on the book was the, the lack of material that I was able to get readily, I suppose, um, looking at experiences north of the border. Um, and what I'm particularly interested in the book is about how activists and revolutionaries address contentious events, um, particularly per contentious personal experiences and the different forms in which they did that. Um, so I, I want to just reflect maybe on some areas that could be um, some avenues, I suppose, for exploring the experiences um, of participants and revolutionaries north of the border. Um, a key, I suppose, overarching argument of my, my general project on the, on the Irish Civil War is that there's been an overemphasis on silence in academic discourse and also popular, um, popular um, debates around this sense of traumatic silence around the, the Irish Civil War of 1922 to 1923. And essentially what I've argued is that this overemphasis on silence has occluded a whole wealth of testimonies that were published, um, particularly in the 1920s and the 1930s, but often in non-conventional sources. Um, and I've used these sources then in the book to, to look at different questions uh, around witnessing gendered and sexual violence, uh, exile, exile, and also perpetrator trauma. Um, I'm not going to be looking at this today, 
Um, but one of the, I suppose, aspects of the, the project was that um, nearly all of the works that I look at predate the Bureau of Military History, which was established in the 1940s, um, and they have been overlooked to date. Um, but a lot of the material I was looking at um, and a lot of the testimony I was uncovering was in places where historians don't usually look, where they don't traditionally look. So looking at how uh, revolutionaries wrote about their lives in story stories that blurred narrative genres. So let's say in fictionalised life writing, in um, drama, in poetry, um, also hidden in uh, gothic and romance modes. Um, and one of the key findings is the fact that fictional, fictionalised renderings of personal experience during this period nearly out, outweighed the number of straight up published autobiographies, which I think is quite significant, particularly um, in the context of women as well, and um, that there are far more fictionalised accounts of personal experience than there were straight up autobiographies um, by the end of the 1930s. Um, and this reflects literary practice of the time. Autobiographical novels were particularly popular across Europe in the 1930s. Um, and it also then, I suppose, suggests what psychologists refer to as the, the urge to tell and to be heard that's often shared by people who go through, through traumatic experiences. Even though we think of trauma as associated with silence, there's often a, a desire to process that experience in, in various different forms. And one of the other aspects um, that I think I've got to... Oh, it's not in there. Uh, not to worry. Uh, one of the other aspects is that there's a, str a strong emphasis, I suppose, on processing and therapeutic writing coming through a lot of these. A lot of these writings are written with an express purpose to process experiences, which is quite interesting. Um, but anyway, for, th for the purpose of today, um, I want to address the, the, the North as a silence within this civil war silence. Um, and just to look at a few examples of the, the silence associate, associated with the Irish civil war. Um, we see this in widespread coverage um, up until the present. I'm quite interested in how the silence of the Civil War is repeatedly reiterated. Um, there's uh, an example here, which is the unspeakable war. This was a journalist called Owen Neeson writing in the 1950s, referring to the events of the Irish Civil War as the unspeakable war. Um, equally, the guidance from the Expert Advisory Committee on Commemorations um, refers to the fact that there was nothing ignoble in the many silences that followed the Irish Civil War they were a better alternative to simplistic polarised narratives and myths making. Um, and equally, let's say, in the Machnov events, again, some emphasis on silence. And I suppose what I'm interested in is that, yes, there was the silence, but what about the silence breakers and what were the processes of silence then that silenced the silence breakers, those who went against the silence? And we can also see it then in, in literary uh, um, considerations of the period and the, the belief that creative literature inspired by the Civil War remained scanty, um, which has been reiterated quite recently as well, um, which doesn't line up, I suppose, what, what I've been looking at. Um, but anyway, in terms of today's paper, um, I just want to ad address three points, I suppose. Um, the first one is the, the terminology of the Irish Civil War and what is included from that and from the scholarship. And the second is processes of silence and processes of silencing uh, when it comes to the North and Northern Ireland. Um, so what is it um, that stops both the production of testimonies and also what, was it, what is it that silences those testimonies that are produced? Um, and then the third thing is to, to look at maybe alternative avenues and archives that might open up further models of exploration given the silences in, in other um, sources and other official archives. Um, so the first thing is just in terms of the, the Civil War, and I, I won't be able to go, go through all of this because there's um, a, a, a lot of detail here, and I'm also conscious that this will be co covered in, in some of the later papers as well. Um, but what I want to state is that, that the, the Civil War, the Irish Civil War, is essentially the Southern Irish Civil War, even though maybe that's something that's, that's not always included. Um, but the, the scholarship on the Irish Civil War tends to be focused on the 26 counties. Um, and it doesn't incorporate what's happening north of the border. Um, and I think this is at odds with even the terminology of the time. If we look at newspaper reporting at the time, we do see the word civil war being used again and again to account for tensions between nationalist and unionist north of the border. Yet the, the Irish civil war, the, the war be between anti-treaty and pro-treaty um, revolutionaries has occluded, I suppose, the, the other aspects of civil war um, on the island at the time. 
Um, and I think it illustrates the way that Irish history has been partitioned in many senses, even when um, scholars are addressing periods prior to partition, there's still a tendency to divide um, the two areas. Um, and what we find then is that there's an, exclu an occlusion of experiences north of the border. I think one of the more striking examples for me anyway is um, the um, lack of scholarship on female revolutionaries who were interned during the Civil War period north of the border that haven't been included in any uh, works that, that, that I'm aware of anyway. I know we have um, an MA student at the moment working on that, but I think that's a really important ex uh, uh, topic, but also a very striking example of how glaring some of these absences are. Um, that said, I think recent scholarship on the Civil War period has been reassessing the significance of the question of partition in the context of the, the hostilities of the Civil War, and um, John Dorney will be speaking about that um, later, but I think we're really indebted to some of the recent scholarship um, that is bringing up that question, because there definitely was a tendency to, to suggest that the treaty debates um, following the, the um, Anglo-Irish Anglo Treaty weren't concerned with partition. Um, and I think if we look at the debates, there's probably a, a, a reason to believe that. But at the same time, there are numerous examples where we can see that the events that, that were happening north of the border have a very direct impact on the outbreak of hostilities in Dublin with the outbreak of the, the Civil War. And um, just to give a few examples that, that other scholars, I suppose, have pointed to. Um, the first is that um, the, out, the arrest of Ginger O'Connell, who was um, National Army Deputy Chief of Staff in the pro-treaty pro uh, Free State Army. Um, he was uh, arrested, um, or he was uh, kidnapped, uh, apologies, by the anti-treaty side, um, and that was in retaliation for the arrest of an anti-treaty officer, Leo Henderson. Um, and the reason that Leo Henderson was arrested is that because he was um, enforcing he was charged with enforcing the Belfast boycott in Dublin. Um, that was to say that he was preventing Dublin firms doing business with Belfast companies. And this was seen as a tactic, I suppose, to oppose the violence that was occurring in Belfast at the time. And John Dorney has written about this in more detail. Um, the other question then is um, the assassination of um, Sir Henry Wilson in London, which at the time was seen as... Um, I suppose, a response to his role in implementing, um, or I suppose in his connected or perceived role in um, overseeing violence against nationalists in the north. So there's a very direct connection there. Um, and then the, the other thing uh, that we'll look at is the number of refugees who are in Dublin during the, the Battle of the Four Courts, during the, the um, outbreak of civil war in Dublin, and how um, Republicans on the anti-treaty and pro-treaty side are essentially in, in conflict with each other over who can look after the refugees um, as, as, as best as possible. Um, just in terms of what's happening um, in, in um, Northern Ireland and in Belfast at the time, um, I, again, I can't go into too much detail and we'll come back to this later, but there are, this is a period of extreme violence from the summer of 1920 up until the spring of 1922, and there, I suppose, are four peaks of violence, and this has been outlined by the historian Kieran Glennon. Um, but we have peak of violence in the summer of 1920, and um, which is associated particularly with the expulsion of both Catholic and also socialist-leaning Protestants from the shipyards in Belfast, which led to out outbreaks of violence. And um, there's further violence then in the summer of 1921. Um, again then in late 1921, and the bloodiest period then is the, the spring of 1922, leading into the, the summer of 1922, where, when we see the official outbreak of the Southern Irish Civil War, I suppose. Um, and um, in this later period, there are 230 people who are killed, um, which is more than in the preceding 19 months, very high, high numbers of fatalities. And some of the most, I suppose, um, notorious incidences would include on Weaver Street, when there was a bomb thrown into Weaver Street, and, and, and um, a number of children and women were killed. Um, there's also equally the, the cases of the, the murder gangs, that are referred to as the, the murder gangs, and the killings of a number of, pro of prominent um, members of the community. Um, so really quite, quite a violent period. Um, and I think that's important to, to think of in terms of what's the reaction to that and how is that remembered um, and how is it not remembered oftentimes. Um, I suppose the first thing to note is how, on the one hand, there was attempts, um, I think I had it. Oh, maybe I don't have it. Not to worry. Um, 
on the one hand, there is attempts to document the period so that the pro-treaty uh, government under Michael Collins actually commissioned a report to, uh, to document the events of what were happening in, in Belfast. And this was um, led to the publication of a, a, a document um, which was um, uh, published under, by, uh, by a Catholic priest called Father John Hassan under a pseudonym. Um, and it, it documents the, the, um, the violence that I, I've just outlined. Um, but when it was presented to the um, government in the South, it was seen to be possibly too contentious and possibly would give ammunition to the anti-treaty side. Um, and even though that this was published, they actually pulped all of the copies except for 18 of this report, um, which was um, Father Hassan's report. So I suppose what we can see there is a, there's a willingness to document the experience, but also then a, a repression of this testimony that this was something that was too contentious. Um, so that just brings me then to my next point, which is looking at archival material, and I'll come back. Oh, that's it there. Sorry, so censorship and active forgetting. So um, the facts and figures of the Belfast Programme 1920 to 1922, where only 80, 18 of the original copies survived. So we, what we have is active forgetting in, in, in this case. Um, but that just brings me then to the state archives and what have the state archives um, added to our understanding. Um, so there are, is material, um, particularly in the Bureau of Military History and the Military Service Pensions Collection, um, relating to events north of the border. Um, and what we'll find in particularly in the, in the Bureau, so if any of you are familiar with the Bureau of Military History, was essentially a collection of sta statements that are gathered from 1947 to 1957 from participants um, who were involved in the revolutionary period. But there is an underrepresentation in terms of those who are north of the border. And the other thing is we'll, we'll tend to have, I suppose, southern in, insights from a southern perspective on what was happening in Belfast at the time, which is still quite quite interesting, but there's, uh, there's um, nevertheless ga gaps in terms of the material that's included. Um, in terms of other material, um, there, there's also the common amount nominal files, so these files were put together around the collection or the um, applications for pensions. Um, in the 1930s really is when they, they began to collect this material. And we do find again that there are significant gaps in terms of the membership roles of, of women activists. Um, I just have one quote on the slide, the yellow quote there. And this is relating to County Down. And we can see there it says that originally there were about 20 members in the branch. Um, but these are all that we can trace at the present time, that many of the names could no longer be traced, that these women were no longer in the local area. Um, particularly striking is the fact that the Belfast Common Amon never actually filed any documentation or nominal roles regarding the membership um, to the um, Bureau of Military History. And then the other thing we find, and um, it's on the right here, is the um, use of addresses. And this is um, Eva Monaghan from Points Pass. Um, which is on the borders with Armagh and um, down. Um, but what we'll see there is the first number of addresses are in the south. We have a Louth address, another Louth address, and a Dublin address. Um, and this reflects that the unease among certain um, revolutionaries um, to correspond with the military service um, pension collection in, in, or the, the military service board in Dublin with their addresses um, in Northern Ireland for fear that the post could be inter intercepted and also that that, that would lead to, to potential repercussions. Um, and that's something that we see again, that there is an unease around correspondence. And um, that's why there's um, some interesting non-state archives, I suppose, that give um, further insights. Um, one is the Lou O'Kane collection recordings, and these are available in the library, in, in our Man O'Fee library. And they've also been, some of them have been digitalized in the last number of months as well, which may be of, of, of some interest. So they're on, on YouTube, and he carried out a collection of quite a number of, of interviews, more than 80 audio recording interviews, particularly with um, activists from Antrim, Armagh, Derry, and Tyrone. And then the other um, volume that I was involved in myself was the, the Men Will Talk To Me volume um, publication, which is a collection of 14 interviews um, by veterans, again, from the Northern Divisions, um, so from across Ulster. Um, and what was interesting here is that none of these uh, veterans had given uh, statements to the Bureau of Mil Military History, um, yet they spoke to Ernie O'Malley. So, and they, they do give some, some very interesting insights, particularly the experiences of Belfast revolutionaries who then um, were, act were, I suppose, were on the pro-treaty um, side in the Free State Army and ended up in the Curragh. 
Um, the only thing to, to mention there is that there's only 14 interviews from across Ulster. If we look at the amount of interviews that Ernie O'Malley gathered from places like Cork, places like Dublin, there's far more than that. So it's, it's still quite a small uh, archive, but it's still significant never, uh, nevertheless. Um, so I'll move on then to just some of the other testimonies. I'm conscious of time as well. Um, so I wanted to just quickly look at fiction, um, because that's what I've be been interested in. Um, because what we do find is there can be insight that in these less conventional sources that were published at the time. And one case is that the fiction of Ernie O'Malley, which actually hasn't been um, published. And I'll just read the, the quote here, um, because it does give a fascinating insight to the experiences of these civilian refugees who were um, actually put up in the Kildare Street Club, if any of you are familiar with it, it's now part of the National Library. Um, but this was essentially occupied at the time by um, revolutionary activists, I, I presume the anti-treaty IRA. It would have been seen as a, as a place, a kind of a centre point of the Protestant ascendancy as a very symbolic place in Dublin, and it's occupied there, therefore in the, the, in the period of the Civil War and used to harbour um, Belfast refugees. And so Ernie O'Malley writes, their shabby clothes were a contrast to the subdued splendour of the club. Some had suitcases or cardboard boxes tied at their bulging middles with rope. They had never dreamt of such splendour. Glass chandeliers, lion and bearskin, strange weapons and war clubs from distant and, in distant and inaccessible parts of the world. Soft, ca soft carpets, oil paintings, lounging chairs that were hard to lift oneself out of and reading lamps. The bitter memory of the Belfast fighting was in their eyes and faces. The, these southern men were kind enough, they thought, but they ached for the north bad enough as it was. Um, and it actually does reflect the fact that many of these Belfast refugees returned to Belfast after, I suppose, tensions eased, um, which, is, which I think is um, maybe bearing out what, what Ernie O'Malley was witnessing. Um, another example that you might be familiar with is Call My Brother Back. Um, which um, again addresses this period in an autobiographical novel form um, by um, Michael McLaverty. Um, and then another example is a really interesting novel by a woman called Una Baniixa, who is from a, a Church of Ireland background um, and had learned Irish as part of the, the Gaelic League. And she writes this novel building on her own experience as actually a teacher who went out to Canada to teach in Canada. But she brings in a, a civil war narrative um, and in this case, it's, it's, it's quite, a, um, quite a heavy account in many ways. It was advertised quite falsely as a, as a touching little romance. But essentially what we have is that the Civil War invades the, the domestic sp space, that the um, father and, and the um, husband and wife find themselves on opposing sides of the treaty divide, um, that in this case the wife is against violence and um, reflecting the author's pacifist concerns. Um, and in this extract, she actually f flees from um, her husband. There's a hint, hint around domestic violence. And she goes to Belfast. But what she's, what's interesting is she says what, why she goes to Belfast. Hogus mai er veil ferste mar via isagam nach meg eingar eg mihal me lanacht na fiu wan mhuirs de chuirn sin. And so she says, I went to Belfast because I knew there was no chance that Michal, her husband, would come after me there or that he would even ask for me there. So we have this context of her fleeing from a, a domestic violence case to a, a, a location of extreme violence in this context, but is seen, I, I suppose it points to this um, divide already between what's happening in the south and a sense that what's happening in the north is not something that would be touched. That, and in this case, it gives her a sense of protection by going up north. Um, one or two more, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up because I'm conscious of time. Um, I've also done quite a, a, a lot of research on this really remarkable couple um, called um, Pork O'Horan and then his wife Eileen Dolan. And what's really interesting here is that Pork O'Horan was a Dublin native. He, he was around 19 when the Battle of the Four Courts broke out. Um, and he mobilised at the time. He hadn't been, he'd been too young, I suppose, to be active in the 1916 Rising. So this was his opportunity um, to, I suppose, have some t taste of action. Um, but he was really quite dismayed. He was in prison quite quickly, like a lot of the anti-treaty um, revolutions at the, t at the time, and spent the next year and a half in prison. And he was so disillusioned by what he saw and what he experienced during this short period of fighting in, in prison 
that when he came out of the prison, he actually converted to Methodism. Um, and part of this was to do with his disgust with the, the Catholic Church and the mistreatment of anti-treaty activists by the Catholic Church, and also his unease with the leadership of the anti-treaty IRA as well. Um, so he um, was stationed Okay, for a time of one or two minutes. Um, he was stationed um, in Belfast for a number of years, and we can just see examples of him there um, reflecting on his IRA background um, to, um, I think, a very popular as well. Um, but he also wrote a number of um, accounts of his experience, and what's interesting is that he wrote an account that was published in the Irish Christian Advocate, which was published in Belfast, and another one in the Methodist, Methodist Magazine, which was published in London. And we get more insight in the Methodist Magazine in terms of the, the tensions in Dublin during this period um, between the Dublin Dubliners in the tenements in Dublin and the Belfast refugees who'd moved in and he actually has a description of a case where there's a knife borne by one woman against another and I suppose this really severe tension between um, the, these people during this very heightened um, period in, 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 of, of warfare and the, 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 I suppose the impact of the refugees bringing, coming into the area. Um, just in terms of his wife then I Dolan, she also converted to Methodism. We can see here in North Belfast Mission People's Hall um, was very well regarded, again, attracting huge crowds who were interested in her story as someone who had been in prison during the Civil War and then converted to Methodism. Um, and she wrote an, an, a number of uh, writings, um, both autobiographical, she also wrote short stories reflecting on her experience. She went on to be a best-selling romance novelist. But one of the things that's interesting in her short stories is she draws on the big house literature tradition. She's interested in Yeats, she's interested in Lady Gregory. But often her stories are about these reconciled romances between dispossessed rural um, Catholic farmers and then dispossessed Protestants of the big houses who, I suppose, have their lives that are equally crumbling in this period in the aftermath of um, the establishment of the Free State. Um, so we quite literally, I suppose, marrying the plight of these two dispossessed groups in her works. Um, and then the last two points, really quickly, is just um, to look beyond, again, the traditional archives and what people have in their homes. And um, this is something that I came across um, recently, um, I'm from RD in County Loud, and somebody in the area had a whole file of documents from when the Belfast refugees had been in RD County Loud, and these were just sitting in somebody's house. So again, that there is material out there that hasn't yet been archived. I can't go into this, but we can just see this poem which reflects the plight of these individuals. Our hearts were high with glory and hope of our own dear country, you in Belfast, I in Tyrone, and not here in RD. So they're not very happy about being in RD County Loud. And also the, the real difficulties. We have a case, and the, the tragedy is a case of a, a young child dying at the age of two years um, here in, in RD as well, and a, a homage to that young child, so being displaced and the difficulties with that. And the final um, source then, is again going back to what, what is lying in people's drawers without really understanding it. Um, one of the things I did do in my book is I, I addressed my own family's implications in, in this period and how when I was coming through a lot of this research, you essentially come across family stories without intending to, that, that that's something that happens. Um, and this was something that I came across only during the summer after um, the book was written, so it wasn't included. Um, but this is my great uncle who had um, this document, um, where my great great grandfather Jim Timoney of Balik was giving, given an expulsion order and given a number of hours to leave Northern Ireland, and that's in um, um, in the summer of 1922. Um, and the reason for this is that he ran a co-op, a creamery. Um, so that was something that is still quite um, difficult and something that I'll tease out, I think, in, in further research. But it's something that um, my grandmother had never knew about, something that certainly was not spoken about, something that had major ramifications in terms of um, the family having to relocate under very strange circumstances. And they did come back then to Balik, and they're still in Balik a number of years later. But that's been sitting in a drawer for 100 years and preserved in the bottom of a drawer. And so that's, again, what, what is in people's homes that hasn't been fully integrated into the narrative. Um, so I leave it there. Um, Mila Buick is sorry for going slightly over time there. Um, but if anyone wants to contact me, um, I'm here at Queen's in Rhianna Gwig and Mila Buick. Thank you. Thank you, Shifra. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Gerard Hanley, who's a research fellow in Dublin City University.
and uh, has recently uh, co-written a biography of uh, Cahill Brewer. So he'll be speaking on the postal strike, which is the first major test of the new free state government in uh, industrial relations. So Thank Jared, you. Uh, good morning. Um, the postal strike of 1922 has been somewhat obscured by the events of the Civil War. And, um, I would like to concentrate on those events and um, how the government um, reacted and responded to the events because I think the postal strike was an, an important event in that it did kind of form kind of the outlook of the coming and Gale government to labour relations kind of over the, over the following years. Um, the postal strike in September 1922 was the first major industrial crisis encountered by the new Irish Free State Government, and it occurred shortly after the commencement of the war. The Free State Government assumed control of the Irish Postal Service in respect of the 26 counties from the Postmaster General in London, with effect from the 19th of January 1922. James James J. or J. J. Walsh was appointed Postmaster General and he later took on the title of Minister for Post and Telegraphs. Um, he took it on with a certain level of confidence and in his first address uh, to his staff, uh, Walsh reminded them, for the first time, the Irish staffs are working for an Irish government. For the first time, they are responsible for the providing of an efficient service to an Irish government alone, to the Irish people alone. And in the providing and maintaining of an efficient service, I feel confident that I can rely upon the wholehearted cooperation of men and women of all grades." End of quote. Walsh soon discovered that his sense of confidence was badly misplaced. The dispute was prompted by the threat of the provisional government to cut the cost of living bonus paid to civil servants. This twice yearly payment was introduced by the British government during the First World War due to the dramatic rise in the cost of living. And as prices continued to rise, the bonus was kept in place. When the provisional government decided to cut the bonus payments due to a fall in the cost of living, in 1921, only postal workers resisted. For most postal workers, the bonus was a critical and an integral element of employment income. Many postal workers had not experienced any significant review of wages since 1870. And in fact, a Royal Commission of Labour minority report found that the wages paid to some postal workers was, such, was at such a low level that, quote, efficiency and decent family life cannot be maintained, end of quote. This perhaps explains the determination of Irish postal workers to resist wage cuts in 1922. A threat by the postal workers to strike in, in February 1922 prompted Walsh to ask the British Postmaster General to provide strike breakers from the ranks of British postal workers in the event of an Irish strike. The request infuriated many of Walsh's cabinet colleagues, and it was later repudiated by the provisional government given the optics of using scab labour from Britain. In the event, a strike was averted just hours before it was due to begin on the 5th of March. The government reached agreement with postal unions to establish a commission of inquiry into the wages and conditions of, employ of uh, postal workers. Senator James uh, Green Douglas, <coughs> a Dublin businessman, was chosen by Collins to act as chairman. The Commission also comprised of two government nominees and two members nominated by the Irish Labour Party. The Commission's interim report on the 11th of May recommended a basic wage increase ranging from 7.5% to 12.5% to compensate postal workers for the hardship caused by the forced cuts. <coughs> 
The increase, however, was only recommended as a temporary measure pending the establishment of an Irish cost of living figure, which should then determine future pay levels. The Government initially agreed to implement the Commission's interim report, but the advent of civil war allowed it to renege on that promise and caused the suspension of the Commission's work until the 31st of October. In September, an interdepartmental committee determined that the Irish cost of living figure was 90 per cent higher than in August 1914, and this figure was used by the Government to justify a cut in, in the Bowman's pay payments. The Government's attempts to force the bonus reductions based on the findings of the Interdepartmental Committee, but without consultation with either the, con with either the, without the consultation of either the Commission or the postal unions, became public on the 4th of September. And it created doubt about the credibility of the committee, committee's findings. Adding fuel to an already inflamed situation, the government also declared that it did not recognise the right of civil servants to strike, and this only reinforced the determination of postal workers to strike. An offer by Walsh on the 9th of September to soften the impact of the wage cuts by implementing them in two phases over a three-month period was rejected by the postal unions. The nature of the workers' grievances and the claims of the postal unions oscillated from a call for the withdrawal of the bonus cuts to a claim for an increase in basic pay, thus confusing the nature of the workers' demands and the purpose of the dispute. The strike began on the, on the uh, 10th of September, and here we have postal workers congregating for a march in Parnell Square. In the Dáil on the 11th of September, the government refused to withdraw its claim that civil servants had no right to strike. Kevin O'Higgins, the Minister for Justice, implied that the government's attitude to picketing civil servants was driven by a concern that anti-treaty forces might take advantage of the strike by commandeering unprotected public buildings, which could then be used, quote, as a screen for the sniper with bomb or rifle or revolver, end of quote. In his statement to the Bureau of Military History, Ernest Bly conceded that the very difficulties of the time made it easier for the government to face up to a strike in a manner that would not have been possible in peacetime. The strike was organised by a joint committee of three postal unions, the Irish Postal Union, the Irish Postal Workers Union and the Irish Post Office Engineering Union. It had the overwhelming support of both urban and rural members. Estimates of the numbers striking uh, varied. Union sources claimed that 12,000 men were on strike and that only 2 per cent continued to work. On the 16th of September, the Irish Times reported 7,000 striking workers nationwide, with over 2,500 striking in Dublin. Many of the striking workers Many of the striking workers were incensed by the fact that although they had answered the call to strike in April 1920 in support of the release of political prisoners, J.J. Walsh was one such prisoner, an Irish government in 1922 should now declare that they had no right to strike. This is a very grainy photograph of postal workers uh, at the time. But the, the prominent placards don't refer to a, a reduction in the bonus cut or to an increase in pay. The placards refer to the fact that postal workers in large numbers came out on strike in support of political prisoners in 1920, and that many of those political prisoners, now politicians, some of them government ministers, take the decision that civil servants have no right to strike. The unity of purpose of the postal strike took Walsh by surprise, yet his dogged efforts to depict this, the dispute as, quote, a complete conspiracy against the people, end of quote, 
and to ascribe political motives to it helped undermine any swell of public support for the strikers. Walsh also insisted that the anti-treaty IRA would take advantage of the strike. Accordingly, on the 12th of September, the Minister for Defence, at Walsh's request, issued instructions to the National Army to prevent the congregation of persons at such points that might facilitate, quote, the possible rushing of any building by men operating under the shelter of a crowd, obviously a pretext for, dis for dispersing picketing postal workers. Consequently, soldiers were deployed in the immediate vicinity of the Central Sorting Office in Dublin's Amiens Street. Walsh also obtained military intervention in Limerick, Kilkenny and Wexford and requested further inter intervention in respect of local picketing in Mallow, Carrigan Shannon, Galway, Thurlis and Bray. The circumstances of the Civil War conveniently allowed Walsh to make persistent but unsubstantiated charges that the postal dispute had been hijacked by the anti-treaty IRA and that its, its leaders were, quote, a body of men armed with revolvers, end of quote. Yet the only arms produced were those of the military and intelligence officers when intimidating striking pickets. The charges made by Walsh underscored the weakness of Labour in the Dáil and the lack of any real political opposition to challenge such spurious claims. The Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress had failed to provide any effective leadership and lacked a coherent strategy for dealing with the issues at the heart of the postal dispute. Government intimidation and harassment of striking workers was pronounced from the outset and was presided over by Joe McGrath, the Director of Intelligence, and the Central Investigation Department. Shots were discharged over the heads of those on picket duty. Pickets were arrested and detained without charge. Drivers were forced to carry mail at gunpoint. An armoured car was repeatedly driven at pickets. Strikers were told by various soldiers that their orders were shoot to kill, even though no evidence exists that this was official policy. Union headquarters were raided by the military and union officials detained and arrested. And here we have a picture of striking postal workers accompanying an arrested union official uh, to a local police barracks on the 16th of September. A female striker was slightly wounded by a bullet at Crown Alley, Dublin, on the 17th of September. And striking workers, including some females, were assaulted in Limerick by troops brandishing knuckle dusters and revolvers. Appeals to the Minister for Defence by both the Postal Unions and the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress to conduct an inquiry into this incident went unanswered. However, an internal army report claimed, quote, the lady picketers distinguished themselves in the fight and got what they deserved. End of quote. The Nationalist and Leinster Times described the government as, quote, determined to use all possible power, forces, propaganda and means to deny postal workers their claim to a living wage and their rights to carry into operation their functions as trade unionists. End of quote. Government attempts to break the strike included offering release for a Mount Joy prisoner, prison to, pro, to political prisoners who were ex-post office staff or who had experience of postal work. There is no evidence that anyone accepted the offer. Likewise, a call for postal service pensioners and ex-postal employees to volunteer their services did not elicit any significant response. Another strategy pursued by Walsh was to reassign a number of non-striking post office officials to Cork, Walsh's home county, in an attempt to break the strike there. This was opposed by General Emmett Dalton, who was in command of the National Army Forces in the Munster region at the time, as it had the potential to alienate local support for the provisional government, especially when tensions were already high following the death of Michael Collins.
The irony of the government's forceful intervention was that Walsh himself was a former postal worker and active trade unionist. As the postal dispute became more entangled with the events of the Civil War, it was difficult at times to determine which was causing greater inconvenience to the public. Andy Cope, the principal British civil, civil servant then in Ireland, reported, quote, Peace prospects, military and postal, are at a heavy discount this weekend. Tired of pacts and compromises that lead nowhere, the government appeared determined to fight both battles out to the finish, end of quote. After almost three weeks of military and police harassment and intimidation, settlement terms were agreed and the dispute ended on the 29th of September. The government forced through the pay cuts and the only concession won by the unions was that the cuts would be spread over three months, an offer made before the strike but rejected. James Douglas was central to the settlement and believing Walsh was intent on punishing ringleaders, persuaded the Cabinet to give an undertaking that there would be no retribution. Walsh did not adhere to this. That Walsh remained embittered is evident in his 1944 memoir. The post office staff, which had never dared say boo while the British were here, took strike action before we had time to get into our stride. We could scarcely help feeling aggrieved at what we considered a stab in the back, and in particular, observing that the Postal Workers Organisation covered the 32 counties, the strike was confined to the 26. End of quote. Despite the undertaking given collectively by the Cabinet and the personal assurances provided to both the Labour Party and Douglas by President Cosgrave, there were numerous instances of victimisation of workers who had gone on strike. Temporary workers were dismissed, non-striking workers promoted, and striking workers forced to transfer or retire. Any suspicion of striking postal workers or family members supporting the anti-treaty side was sufficient grounds for transfer to another part of the country. It is also somewhat ironic that Walsh, in his witness statement to the Bureau of Military History some years later, should complain of his forced transfer from the Postal Service in Cork to Bradford in the UK in 1914, and his subsequent dismissal from the Postal Service under what he describes as, quote, a policy of victimisation, end of quote, initiated by the British government against those opposing the recruitment of Irish men into the British forces. Yet he had no difficulty in applying a similar policy to his own staff working for an Irish government. Civil war is hardly an environment conducive to the practice of fair and respectful labour relations, and so it proved in Ireland. Notwithstanding the formidable challenges facing an inexperienced government fearful for the survival of the state, the government's response to the postal worker strike was belligerent. Its hostility mirrored its treatment of anti-treaty Republicans. The government's disdain for one was as strong as its contempt for the other. In the aftermath of the Civil War, striking postal workers were as much casualties of political victimisation and vindictiveness as Republicans. The government, wrongly, held that both political and labour unrest were driven by the same elements of society. Consequently, labour unrest was viewed as a danger to the interests of both the state and society. In his memoirs, Walsh summed up the feelings of many in the government when he wrote that, quote, at this critical juncture to smash such a well-organised strike was a salutary lesson to the general indiscipline at the time, end of quote. Consequently, this dispute proved to be a formative experience for the coming Ale government, who for the next decade viewed labour relations and labour unrest only through the prism of the civil war. The question has been posed, 
Was this simply a government determined not to be diverted from the main aim, winning the civil war? Or the early signals that this war was also a class war, with a government overtly hostile to workers? Perhaps it was both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, our final speaker is uh, John Dorney, who is uh, editor of the Irish Story uh, website, which contains uh, a variety of articles on uh, aspects of Ireland 19, well, during the Civil War period. It is well worth a visit for uh, all sorts of things. It's like, it's like entering a sweet shop in many ways. You, know, you, you see all sorts of things you fancy and want to look at. So, uh, John. That's, that's very nice of you, Emma. Thank you very much. Um, let me just check this is working. No. Nope. There we go. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thanks very much for, to Emma for the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me here to Belfast today. Um, I've mostly researched the Civil War in Dublin, but I thought as we, I was in Belfast today, um, I should address that part of the Civil War in Dublin, which does overlap with Northern Ireland and particularly with Belfast. Um, the quote, the bit they had that fed them, actually comes from an anti-treaty Republican and it refers to the Belfast refugees in Dublin in early 1922. So the main points of what I'm going to talk about here is Belfast nationalist refugees, Catholic refugees, were a considerable humanitarian problem in the South in the spring and summer of 1922. Um, both pro and anti treaty factions competed to house them in Dublin and to champion them. However, what may have been and what was some intended to have been as a source of unity between the two factions in the South eventually became a source of division because they ended up competing over who was the better champion of the northern refugees. The other thing is, and Schiefer has mentioned this already, is that the anti treaty side's seizure of property ostensibly on behalf of Northern refugees, was actually partly the spark that led to the outbreak of civil war at the Four Courts. So the context, of course, is violence here in Belfast in the spring of 1922. And this photograph, this tragic photograph, is of the McMahon family, who were, of course, killed um, probably by undercover uh, police officers, either of the RC or the Ulster Special Constabulary, in March of 1922. Um, it is in many ways, of course, the other civil war, as Schieffer has already alluded to. But basically, the, cr the chronology is this. Uh, it kicks off with um, a series of arrests and kidnappings by both sides, but the violence kicks off really with the Clonus of Frey, so-called, on February 11th, 1922, where four Ulster Special Constabulary officers were killed. Also, an IRA officer was killed um, when they were attempting to change trains in Clonus. It was a shootout. Um, this kicked off the bloodiest, not the first, of course, but the bloodiest phase of violence in Belfast, the McMahon murders, where uh, five members of a Catholic family were killed. It's one of the most prominent incidents. Also, the Arnon Street killings, which were the following year, where in reprisal for an IRA shooting of a policeman, uh, uniformed police broke into houses on Arnon Street and killed a number of people there. It was, of course, it was, of course, a two-way street, and it, it, we have roughly the figures on the casualties of violence in Belfast out of about 500. Um, casualties, um, only about 80 were combatants, um, about 186 were Protestant civilians, and the remainder, which is in the region of 300, were Catholic civilians. House burning and intimidation has to be added to deaths as well. Now, of course, in nationalist memory, this is referred to as the pogrom, one-sided violence against an innocent community. Uh, for me, this is a partisan term, but this is what it's known as in the South at the time. And I would, like Schiefer earlier, push back a little bit against the notion that no one in the South cared at this time about the North. Yes, it's a secondary feature of the treaty debates, but that's because the North is a secondary feature of the treaty. The treaty is about whether the Southern state would be sovereign or not. So in fact, what you find is, I'm sorry, the picture came out a bit small. What you find is the Southern uh, press uh, and both of the factions in the now split Republican movement are outraged, they express public outrage about what's going on in the north, the pogrom, and they both want uh, publicly to help Catholic refugees in the south. And what this is here, you see it's mostly women and children, these are Belfast refugees in Dublin. Now the Irish Independent, which has a very pro-treaty line, uh, but 
li like its sister paper also, the Freeman's Journal, is extremely militant, extremely hardline on the north, and the Irish Independent talks about the barbarism north of the border, the terror in Belfast, and they report that about 20,000 Catholics have fled to the south by June of 1922. There are various figures around in the media of the time, between 10, 20 and 30,000 are the most common. It's very difficult to verify these figures. We have also testimony from things like the Bureau of Military History. This is John McCoy of Dundalk, saying Dundalk was full of refugees and others who claimed to be refugees. And he says there was too many to sort out the bona fides of particular people. Now, the provisional government papers, um, the figure I have comes from Richard Mulcahy's papers, uh, show 1,500 refugees in Dublin by June 1922, which is, of course, is not the whole number, but it's an indication the number may actually be a little bit smaller than 20 or 30,000. But certainly, there's large numbers concentrated in the border areas, and there is at least 1,500 in Dublin city. They arrived into a city in turmoil. So this is a picture of Grafton Street, the main shopping street of Dublin, of course, uh, and it's an IRA patrol, an anti-treaty IRA patrol, in May of 1922. So you have the treaty signed, of course, on December the 6th. You have the IRA split, which took place in Dublin, the formal split, on March 26th, when the anti-treaty IRA emerges. So they disavow the authority of general headquarters of the IRA, but also of the Dáil. They said they had no right to approve the treaty. British evacuation uh, was started in February. They handed over the first barracks in Dublin, Be Beggars Bush Barracks. It gathered pace in April. Um, in that month also, the anti-treaty IRA seized their own garrison, which was the Four Courts in central Dublin, the centre of the legal system. So the city that Belfast refugees arrived into was a city with three rival armies. So you have the pro-treaty army, which is based initially around Beggars Bush Barracks, and later they take on over Portobello Barracks, which is now Cahalbrua Barracks, uh, Wellington Barracks and so on. You have the anti-treaty IRA with a full-time garrison in the Four Courts, but the majority of the guerrilla organisation is also anti-treaty. And you have the British Army. There's still 6,000 British soldiers in the barracks in Dublin's Phoenix Park. So one of the things that the anti-treaty IRA tried to do is they tried to project themselves as the real champions of northern nationalists. And they do this in a very public way by taking over unionist-owned property in Dublin. So it seems strange in these days to speak of unionists in Dublin, but there were indeed unionist properties. Um, they took over the Orange Orders at Dublin headquarters, which was on Fowler Hall on Parnell Square, at the time being renamed from Rutland Square. They took over, as Schieffer mentioned, the Kildare Street Club. The Kildare Street Club was a, a different kind of unionist, uh, kind, what was referred to as high Tories or you know, empire loyalists, so kind of upper class uh, unionists on Kildare Street, which is where eventually the government buildings would be. Um, they took over the Freemasons Hall on Molesworth Street. So in Dublin, especially in the 19th century, Freemasonry was very closely associated with Protestant and unionism, um, again, of a kind of a high unionism persuasion. And they took over the YMCA building, which is, again, you know, it's not so much political, but you can see, I suppose, the, the associations that the anti-treaty IRA have on O'Connell Street. And they use all of these buildings to house the Belfast refugees. Sean Prendergast, who is an anti-treaty IRA member, told the Bureau of Military History many years later, Fowler Hall was turned into a domicile for a large number of Belfast refugees who, on account of the Orange Pogrom, and of course this is the language of the time, fled from their homes and sought shelter in other parts of Ireland. Perhaps no better shelter could be provided except in the haunt of the, ver the very nerve centre of the Orange Order in Dublin, the premises of the would-be Pogrom collaborators. So this is how the anti-treaty IRA want to present themselves. Lawrence Nugent, who was one of the IRA officers concerned with this, said the action of the IRA in seizing these buildings caused flutterings in government circles in Dublin, Belfast and London. So we see it's a political act, it's not just benevolence. They say the British government, the, sorry, the provisional government, the British-sponsored northern government, and he puts it in quotation marks, of course, and the British government were shocked by the news. The British government and the provisional government were particularly alarmed on the score that the action might have serious consequences for the treaty cause. In any case, the spokesmen of each contended that such happenings were lawless, provoking and outrageous, and were intended for the purposes of imperiling the treaty. So, in fact, the provisional government, and especially Michael Collins, want to, want to position themselves as the champion of the northern minority, but the anti-treaty IRA are kind of staking their claim for that position by seizing these properties, which are... Um, it's, it's not, I wouldn't characterise it as a sectarian in the sense of anti-Protestant, but these are clearly political acts. These are buildings with political associations.
The other thing that they do in the forecourts, and this is a picture of the forecourts, of course, is they enforce the Belfast boycott. Now, the Belfast boycott had been applied um, by the Sinn Féin leadership earlier in 1920 in response to the shipyard expulsions of that year. It had been lifted in early 1922 in talks between Michael Collins and James Craig, the new Northern Prime Minister. But the anti-treaty IRA are again trying to assert themselves as the true champion of the Northern cause, Northerners' cause, and they reinforced the Belfast boycott. So there is an office opened in the Four Courts under an officer called Leo Henderson, and their job is to stop any Dublin business from doing business with Belfast. So, for example, on, in May 1922. A squad of anti-treaty IRA men entered Woolworths on Henry Street, which is another big shopping street in Dublin, and they demanded they pay a fine for doing business with Belfast. When they refused, they returned several weeks later with hatchets, and they smashed up all of the produce of the store. So this is the kind of thing that they're doing. Um, Todd Andrews, who uh, at the time was a youthful IRA member in the forecourt, says they grew very unpopular with the local businessmen. Uh, for enforcing the Belfast boycott, but also from seizing produce, what they called commandeering, to feed their garrison, which was about 200 men in the forecourts. This is an IRA notice from May 1922. Uh, basically, you can read it for yourself, but it says that you can subscribe towards the, release, the, the relief of Belfast refugees, and you will have to pay a fine if you do business with Belfast. And they say you can contribute foodstuffs, clothing, etc., to Fowler Hall, Parnell Square, which is, of course, the Orange Order Hall, which they have seized for refugees. And traders are warned not to supply goods ordered unless by official order. So the government response, though, as I said, it shows some of the contradictions that there are in this split in early 1922. The building here is Marlborough Hall, which was a teacher training college in Glasnevin, in the north of Dublin city. And the decision making here, it's, it's kind of revealed by this exchange between Maud Gunn, who was an anti-treaty personality, of course, and Arthur Griffith, who was the president of the provisional government. Maud Gunn says to Arthur Griffith, or sorry, Maud Gunn visits Arthur Griffith, and Griffith says they had no right to take over those properties. It was caused trouble. So Griffith's position is these people are breaking the law. Whether they're well intentioned or not, they're breaking the law. We are the new government. They have to obey the law. Now, Maud Gunn said, what more suitable place than the house belonging to the Orange Men could be found to house victims of the Orange Terror? And Griffith just replies they should not be there. So, what the government's response is, is taking over this teacher training college to house the refugees from Belfast, and Maud Gunn herself admitted this was a much better spot than the more um, evocative buildings which the anti-treaty side had taken over, because this is, of course, a place with beds and accommodation and catering and so on. This is a picture of the IRA on the Freemasons Hall on Molesworth Street. But of these four locations in Dublin City, the Freemasons Hall is one of the ones that is evacuated in a truce with the provisional government in May 1922. The other thing is, the anti-treaty IRA in Dublin didn't necessarily get on all that well with the, rep the Belfast refugee population. So this is again Lawrence Nugent. He complains about the Belfast women in the Kildare Street Club. He said they would only accept milk hot from the cow every morning. That's what he says. And Nugent also complains that he had to pay for it. He complains he wasn't compensated until many years afterwards. Um, a man called Patrick Kelly, who was involved with the refugees on the YMCA club on O'Connell Street, said they objected to having porridge for breakfast every morning. So again, you know, this is, seems to be the attitude of the anti-treaty IRA. They should take what they're given. They should be grateful. Um, he also complains that they were stealing from the shops on O'Connell Street, Dublin's main street, and they had to be relocated back to the Orange Order Hall because there was complaints from local traders. Kelly even says he had to bring down a squad of armed men at one point with a Thompson submachine gun to sort them out because they weren't doing what they're told. So it's, it's an interesting kind of thing that the anti-treaty IRA want to position themselves as the champions of Belfast refugees. They didn't necessarily get on all that well with the actual refugees. So, there are many attempts to avoid civil war in the South, and one of them was to try to reforge unity on the North. So there's a truce and pact in May 1922, and it, one of the aspects of it is an election pact between Michael Collins and Eamon de Valera, but another aspect of it is Liam Lynch and Michael Collins, Liam Lynch, the head of the anti-treaty IRA, get together, and the idea is they will have a joint northern offensive. Um, but one of the aspects of this in Dublin is that the IRA agreed to leave Kildare Street Club and the Freemasons Hall, which, as I said, were the two more elevated if I can say in class terms, unionist properties that they had occupied. The attempt at the Joint Northern Offensive comes to nothing. Um, in the end, it's badly coordinated. It looks very much like Michael Collins pulled out of it at the last moment. But one of the interesting things in Dublin terms is 
Michael Collins for a time used the weapons the British had supplied to his government and to his forces to arm the anti-treatyites in the forecourts in return for their weapons being sent north. And many people comment on this at the time that um, ostensibly these enemies are exchanging weapons in May of 1922. How is this possible? Because ostensibly they both agree at this point on the northern question. Now, the Northern Offensive fails, there's a crackdown by the Northern Ireland Government, the internment is introduced after the assassination of the MP, William Twaddell. Uh, Twaddell, actually, I believe is the right pronunciation, I've been, I've been corrected on that by a few people. Um, at this point, many Northern volunteers fled south, and this is kind of the end of the story. So the outbreak of civil war happens. Schiefer mentioned this, the, out, the spark of the outbreak of civil war is it's the assassination of Henry Wilson in London, yes, the provisional government receives an ultimatum basically from Lloyd George saying you will have to move against the four courts or we'll do it. But the ostensible spark is that Leo Henderson, who had been enforcing the Belfast boycott throughout Dublin for a period of months, was arrested doing so at Ferguson's garage on Dublin's Bagot Street by pro-treaty troops. The anti-treaty side arrest a free state general, Ginger O'Connell, in response, and this is the ostensible reason for the bombardment of the four courts. So, in fact, I would argue that the, the main driving force for the outbreak of civil war in the South is the pressure of the British government, but the ostensible spark is that the anti-treatyites are breaking the law, being overzealous on the North. Now, this is the, the picture there, of course, is pro-treaty troops uh, opening fire in the four courts with artillery. So, wrong, wrong way, there we go. So, the, one of the ironies, one of the many ironies about the civil war, though, is that the majority of Northern IRA men were pro-treaty. So Collins reported about eight to 900 Northern IRA men. According to Kieran Glennon, who has researched Belfast in detail, there's 379 of these are from Belfast. Um, he calculates that 680 men from Belfast joined the National Army, um, of whom most, in fact, had no prior connection with the IRA. And this probably leaks over into the refugee thing. So Belfast uh, men who were in the South as refugees seem to have joined the National Army, the pro-treaty army, uh, in bigger numbers even than the pro-treaty IRA. But the pro-treaty the majority of the Belfast men and Northern men in general who did take part in the Civil War took part on the pro-treaty side for a number of reasons, including Michael Collins championing of their cause and so on, but also perhaps because it's simply the better alternative. You, the pro-treaty army will pay, um, and the alternative is to be interned either in the North or in the South. There are some prominent uh, anti-treaty Republicans in Dublin. For example, Joe McKelvey, who was briefly elected as the Chief of Staff of the IRA, who was eventually executed in December 1922, reprisal for the assassination of Sean Hales TD. And a lesser known but equally important, Michael Carlin, another Belfast man who was the head of anti-treaty IRA intelligence. But to finish up, anti-treaty Republicans' attitude towards the North, actually, in the aftermath of the Civil War, is that the North let them down. It's, a stra it's to our eyes a bit strange, but this is the, the confluence of attitudes at the time. Lawrence Newton said, on the formation of the Free State Army, the men of the North, the men of the Belfast refugees joined up. They bit the hand that fed them, and the women and children were welcomed back in Belfast. Um, but in December 1922, the provisional government also gave up on providing for the refugees in Dublin. So Ernest Blythe, who we heard mention of already, uh, inquired at that time if there was funds available to keep supporting the Belfast refugees in Dublin, and he was told no further funds are available. So by this time, the priority of the pro-treaty government, the provisional government, is simply to win the civil war. Everything else becomes secondary. So it seems that most of the refugees did actually end up back in Belfast, although I think we may need further research on that. Um, Finally, oh, whoops, sorry, I have, I have my last point here. So, solidarity with Northern nationalists is a big political issue in 1922, but it has its limits. It gets overtaken by the struggle that eventually led to the Civil War, which is, in the end, about if there is a single governing authority south of the border. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, John. Well, we have um, what about um, 15 minutes for questions and answers. So, if any of you have any questions, if you'd introduce yourself first, please, and uh, I'm sure our panel will be happy to do the best they can. Eunan. 
not for refugees to my knowledge, but um, there is a thing in the lead up to the Civil War where um, the houses particularly of well-off prominent ex-unionists are, are raided for arms, particularly before the Civil War and just after the Civil War starts, and there's lots of, and some of them are later burned down in reprisal in the Civil War. Um, as regards taking them over for refugees, not to my knowledge, to be honest, it's mostly these, these public buildings, and it kind of, it looks a lot to me like the act of taking over the building and filling them with refugees as a symbol is more important than necessarily finding the best place for refugees, I think. Sorry, constructed as, as, a, as a, a tool, uh, sort of an anti-Protestant tool. No, I don't, I mean, the, men, the mentality, as far as I can see, the mentality of the anti-treaty IRA is not sectarian in that sense. You know, it's, it's like, in one way, it's, it's a very black and white mentality. It's, it's the mentality of people in a fight, but it's like, um, we are for the freedom of Ireland. The people who are against us are the enemy. You know, we know some of these people are the enemy. It's, there's nothing like, for example, attacking, attacking churches, attacking private Protestants in Dublin now, trying to, trying to burn them out. Nothing like that happens in Dublin. Now, there are instances elsewhere in the South which are mixed up a lot of the time with uh, land hunger, agrarian disturbances, where things like that do happen. But the mentality of the anti-treaty IRA is not explicitly sectarian in any way, but it is this, like I said, very black and white mentality, these people are the enemy, you know, we, uh, they're against the freedom of Ireland, therefore, you know, they're subject to, they can be subject to various reprisals. Mm -hmm. Eddie, yeah. yeah. I want to ask uh, Jared if I respond. J.J. Walsh. Uh, Walsh claimed in, in his biography that he'd written, a, had a letter published in an Irish newspaper which he was regarded as treacherous and he was sacked. But I went through the uh, um, uh, the Royal Mail uh, archives, and I could find no record of Walsh ever being sacked. So I wonder, have you, have you any evidence that he actually was sacked by the Royal Mail? Sorry, I didn't catch. He claimed, Walsh claimed that he'd been sacked by the Royal Mail after a letter that he'd written had been published, uh, which was critical of the English, and that he was sacked on a basis of that letter. But I, w I went to the archives at Mount Pleasant yeah. and could find no record of Walsh ever being sacked. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not something I've come across, and uh, I have done research both in Dublin and in the uh, Postal Museum in, in London in relation to the postal strike, and that's not something I've come across. Well, that, that, that's what the, the, the second would have been before the strike, long before the strike. You were sacked in 1915 or 16. I'm sorry. He was sacked in 1915. Oh, oh yeah, he was. Oh yeah, he was sacked in, in 1914. He, he, yeah, in 1914 he was transferred to Bradford, and he was subsequently dismissed uh, from from the postal service. And um, you know, I, I suppose the kind of the point that I make, kind of, he, he's very uh, bitter about the whole question of political victimisation that was meted out to him and others by the British government, uh, but, but yet when he becomes uh, Postmaster General and subsequently uh, the Minister for Post and Telegraphs kind of in Ireland, you know, he, he, has, he has no problem in kind of uh, following a similar policy. You know, my, my point was, I found no record of, in the Royal Mail that he actually was sacked and was dismissed. So I'm wondering, did he actually, was this... Was well, well, look. Well, the main evidence I would have for that is, is in his own statement yeah, to, the, yeah, to the Bureau of Military well, History. I, 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 I didn't come across that. Uh, like my evidence. Yeah, like my evidence is just based on his own admission in the uh, Bureau Bureau of Military History. Okay, I don't know. Okay, so Porik is back. Yeah. And, and just very quickly on the, uh, if you like, the anti-Northern thing, uh, there's a lot of evidence that the Congress of Trade Unions were, had a levy to support workers in the North. But when workers in the North came south looking for jobs, it was made very clear to them in a lot of local branches of unions, uh, you're not taking our jobs. Go back where you came from. <laughs> so I just want to say it wasn't just the anti-treaty or pro-treaty. It was a southern thing. A lot of people resented the idea of these people coming back. And Lawrence Nugent, of course, was deeply coloured by the fact he was a shopkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> and his pocketbook was being affected by uh, the help they were giving. Thank you. Yeah. Question here. 
Hello, Constantine Trover, my name. Uh, my question is for Dr. Aiken concerning the uh, autobiographical uh, novels that were, as he said, a way of dealing with the trauma. I noticed that there was one example that was written in Irish that you mentioned. So my question would be, of course, it makes a difference both in terms of how things are expressed and which audience you write for, uh, uh, making a choice uh, for Irish or English in that case. So. I would like to know whether there are any more examples of people writing these autobiographical novels in Irish and how you would place uh, that kind of decision in this context. Yeah, um, yeah brilliant question. Um, so there's a huge number of autobiographical novels, particularly in the 1930s, and it's a, it's a European thread. Um, there, Irish is quite strongly represented in this commemorative culture, and it's quite interesting because if we look at the, the military archives, for example, there's very little Irish whatsoever. But this is, with the establishment of the Free State, there is a huge emphasis on publishing and producing materials in Irish, particularly for school syllabus to support learning and so on. Um, so Irish is, is very well represented and there's, there's actually, I'm not sure if it totally weighs up, I have to look at it, but it was stated in the 60s that there were nearly more accounts written about the revolution in Irish than in English by the 60s, that there's a huge number of Irish uh, accounts. Um, in terms of the, the reasons for the language choice, it's very, very varied. Um, I suppose you have to remember that for a number of revolutionaries, let's say from the Irish-speaking areas, that this wasn't necessarily a political choice. It was their first language that they're writing in. But then equally, we do find it um, with other writers that there, there may be a political motivation that they're very much involved in, in the Gaelic League. Um, the example I gave there is Una Bani Ixa. She's from a Church of Ireland background. She would have learned her Irish in the Cunamara Gwilta from when we were involved in, in, um, what's set in one of the, the Irish colleges there. Um, from her point of view, I'm not sure if it was, um, well, for some of the women, it may have been a case that there was more protection in the Irish language. There was a, the demand for the material to be written, um, so there was a, a, it would be published, I suppose. Um, there was less readership, potentially, and um, they could get away with more subversive material through the Irish language. Um, and interestingly enough, she didn't write anything in English, as far as I know, but she wrote a number of, 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 of plays and, and novels in Irish. And um, so it, it, there's no like straight answer for that, but there's a, I suppose a lot of very different political motivations, and um, and some of the the, the writings too, which which is what, what I'm interested in is the, the those who don't have the perfect command of Irish but want to write in Irish anyway. I think that's where where it's quite interesting that that would be maybe part of the the state building project to see Irish as being revived and as part of that. So there, there definitely were some writers who went to very um, great lengths, I suppose, to, to process their experiences in Irish. Um, equally, we have uh, great writers who don't write in Irish because there's better audiences. So um, Pather O'Donnell and Liam Flaherty uh, would have been um, native Irish speakers yet writing English because they can uh, get tap into an international audience. Okay. I have a couple of questions uh, for, um, first of all, Dr. Egan. Uh, it's a really interesting range of uh, sources for uh, accounts of the Civil War, uh, both in terms of, you know, linguistic and uh, genre diversity, I suppose. Uh, were many or any of them popular? Did they achieve much circulation? Uh, or is there any way to, I suppose, really um, determine that? Because I'm just wondering, you know, people were, were, as you say, breaking this supposed silence about the Civil War, but was, were many people hearing them? And uh, also for, uh, for Dr. Hanley, you kind of leave this question open-ended uh, in, in your talk about you know whether the government was more uh, genuinely believing that the the strikers were a front for the anti-treaty side, or you know fabricating this excuse to do some union busting, which would have been their political inclination anyway. Um, but you have kind of a, a hunch either way, I suppose, is what I'm wondering. Yep, I'll just answer that. Yeah, and um, thanks for that question. So yeah, the first thing is these were popular. Um, I think it varies again from different texts. Um, I did have uh, one example on the slide that I just didn't get to show, but it's from 1936, and it was a, um, an autobiographical novel um, written by Patrick Malloy, who was a, a Free State Army officer, um, and that was subs subsequently censored. But it was on the bestseller list when it was published. But when you look at the bestseller list from, from that week in Dublin, there are three autobiographical novels by uh, revolutionaries on the bestseller list that, that, that week. So absolutely, there was, a, there was a market for them. We see that again with works that are republished, so we can get engaged in that sense. And um, so I think that what's really fascinating is how was it that even bestsellers have been overlooked and not addressed? And um, 
within um, the, the historical scholarship of the period, um, and particularly women's writings. Um, Annie M. P. Smithson, for example, had a, had a romance novel, again published in 1936, the 30s was really the big era for this. Her, her novels are some of the most best-selling works, um, and she has three chapters in that novel which essentially are, document her Civil War experience, and we can check that now because her pension application is available and she also had an autobiography. So absolutely, they are being read very widely, but I suppose still existing in this counter, um, this, I suppose, space of counter memory and not integrated into the official discourse. Okay. Yeah, just in relation to your question uh, on the attitude of the government to um, the postal strike, uh, you know, was it a case of just winning the civil, civil war? And of course, of course it was. I think any trouble that arose at that stage, you know, whether it be political or labour, um, was seen as a threat to the government. But um, I, I think, as I said, that the civil war and labour matters that occurred during the civil war, particularly the postal strike, and also the farm labourer strike in Waterford um, really shaped the attitude of Cumann and Gale uh, to future labour troubles over the next decade. And one particular example would be the building of the Art and Crusher scheme uh, in Shannon from 1925 to 1929. And it again kind of is an event that uh, we know about because of the engineering kind of fate and kind of, you know, the, 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 the success kind of of a new kind of government kind of undertaking such a project and the benefits that are produced. But that hides uh, the serious kind of problems that were suffered by workers uh, on the Shannon scheme, the disregard to uh, workers, working conditions, living conditions, uh, the rate of pay, the fatalities that occurred kind of on the Shannon scheme. And um, I think the government at that time, there, 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 was a, there, there, was a, there was a scheme called the Fair Wage Clause that had been introduced by the British government, which basically uh, meant that um, government employees or government uh, or, or workers kind of working under contract uh, uh, for the government should be paid a fair rate that would equate to a, the similar rate for that job in the area. And the contractor, Siemens and the government insisted the equivalent rate was the rate of pay for a farm labourer. Now in County Clare at that time, the farm labourer's rate of pay was probably the lowest in the country in, in any event, but Clare probably had, had the lowest, and that's what in, it insisted that it would be paid, despite uh, workers encountering skills that they had never seen in this country before. So, you know, in my view, kind of that, that's another his, uh, hidden kind of aspect of kind of uh, labour relations during that partic particular de decade. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we're running a short of time. Maybe one or two just quick questions at the end. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for Dr. Hanley. Uh, did the Catholic Church get involved at all in the toing and froing on the postal strike? No. To and a, kind of a simple answer to it, and um, I think. You know, the Catholic Church, uh, uh, certainly a, a colleague of mine is more expert kind of on this, kind of like after the establishment of the Irish Free State, the Catholic <coughs> Church was generally very supportive of the new provisional government and uh, the recognition kind of of the democratic process, etc. So I think it was very careful not to interfere uh, with anything that you know, might be seen as critical of the provisional government and its attempts uh, to put uh, proper government structures into place. Now, while I might kind of mention during kind of the postal worker strike uh, how badly they were treated, I still recognise the challenges for the provisional government and a new, a new government 
trying to put new structures into place uh, during very difficult times. Uh, but certainly, um, there was no kind of involvement kind of of the Catholic, ch Catholic Church, and it's something I looked at as well in relation to workers' rights on the Shannon scheme to see uh, if, if there was any involvement uh, or support by the hierarchy for workers on the Shannon sc screen, and there's no real evidence. Okay, I think there's a final question here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just very briefly, two quick points. Um, when I was, I, uh, Blythe comes up quite a lot in my work, Shiva, um, because of his um, rather misogynistic attitudes to women uh, during the Civil War and also afterwards. Um, and I was just going to ask you about the reception of some of the books by women, given that a lot of the revolutionary leaders of the Civil War then went on to establish a, a very patriarchal state. So I'm just curious about reception. And just a footnote, a very interesting documentary about uh, Theresa Devi last week, wow. which I uh, note also um, Blyde had a very negative uh, impact uh, on her work, the deaf uh, playwright from uh, Waterford, a really fascinating documentary. So I was just wondering about reception and patriarchy and how that translated into the reception and reading. And then um, very quickly, John, just, just to point, I suppose, really again, something I've looked at in my own work around Dublin and Protestants and in, in different terms, depending on when you did your degree, you used, we used to call it in migration or internal migration or displacement. Uh, so the way the term refugees is perhaps applied to Belfast, you know, looking at how some some Protestant families in particular from the south, I know Andy has looked at Cork, I've looked a bit at Tipperary as well, where a lot of that was sometimes down to literally, um, you know, obviously harassment and, and those kinds of things, but also actually physical injury as well, mm. um, or the nerves and for treatment in Dublin. And many would have settled around South Dublin, Monkstown, and Leary. So I was just wondering about that, and I suppose the relationship between the Northern mm. and the Southern and how that played out. Sorry, that was a bit okay. long-winded. Yeah, you just ver very quickly on the, on the Southern Protestant thing. My, my research really centered on Dublin City, and what, you know, the Protestant community doesn't shrink dramatically in Dublin at all. Um, but it's, it'd be very interesting to see if you know, Protestants from elsewhere who did suffer a lot of harassment, especially in the early half of 1922, did settle in South Dublin. That'd be very interesting. I, I, I'd, you know, I'd welcome research into that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to come Yeah, then? I'll just say very quickly. So um, in terms of Ernest Bide, there's an interesting example uh, from a Protestant background um, from the North and then writes all his memoirs in Irish as well, as it happens. Um, but just in terms of that, in terms of reception, absolutely the women's writings were much more likely to be received quite scathingly, that the reviews are quite negative or that there's a sense that these are too... Uh, one of the quotes I've come across is, it's too clear a woman wrote this account, things, things like that, so quite patriarchal. In terms of Blythe himself, there's a lot more to be said, and we can talk about it afterwards, but he was also director of the Abbey Theatre, and we see that women were very much pushed to the very edge of the Abbey Theatre um, in, in really quite striking ways. An interesting example is um, Ray de Grada, who was his secretary throughout, throughout the Civil War, and um, who wrote, some of you might be familiar with her famous play um, the, the on, on Trio, which is on the leaving cert, The, the Trial. Um, but she actually um, wrote a play called Hunger Strike in the 1930s that was rejected um, by the Abbey Theatre and a number of others by the theatre, Abbey Theatre. And what's interesting is that she was in Mountjoy. It was probably based on her own experience being in Mountjoy um, for a short time in 1919, but she was actually in Mountjoy at, at a time that Ernest Bide himself was on hunger strike in 1919. Um, yeah, she was later very, very negative about um, not only women's writings, but also about hunger striking as, as, a, as a practice, even though he'd been on hunger strike himself. So he was possibly involved in, I suppose, repressing that play um, and despite that. So there, absolutely there would have been real obstacles in terms of women and I think when we talked about the bestsellers, the women's writings were less likely to be as widely written but there nevertheless was a counter narrative and I think that's why the gothic and the romance modes really worked well for women in that they could get an, an audience when they tapped into these genres I suppose. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for those, those questions and uh, Thank you to, to our panel, our three speakers, for their excellent presentations. I think we've had a wonderful session and uh, an excellent start to the day's proceedings. So there's coffee awaiting you at the, the, the back of the hall. Thank you. Thank you.